So uh, thanks to all of you for being here. Thanks to, to you guys, of course, for being here. And um, we have here a, a panel of soon to be recognized awesome panelists because we um, had a chance to speak beforehand. Um, and I think I like the way this was set up because uh, we followed a, a great panel prior to ours, which was a nice introduction to AR VR. So I think we're going to go a little bit deeper into, into what the future of AR and VR is. Um, and so what I want to start with is to give each of you um, uh, just a minute or so to kind of introduce yourselves, uh, talk about what you do and what you're passionate about. Do we start with me? Yeah. Oh, fantastic. So my name is Travis, and I'm the co-founder of Lumiere VR. Uh, we focus on two main things. Both are very content-driven, um, content production and content distribution. So for content production, we have a suite of technology, including a multi-rig camera system. And basically, the goal is to make uh, 360 live-action filmmaking just as versatile as your 16 by 9 traditional filmmaking kind of cinematography. And then for distribution, we're working with multiple partners to build kind of uh, VR theaters across the nation so folks like yourself don't have to spend a fortune to try these technologies out. And yeah, so I guess as a VR guy, the most exciting thing about this is to really truly grasp the grammar of virtual reality filmmaking. And um, I'll be talking more on that later on. Yeah. Hi, I'm Philip. Um, we at Hashplay have created a software platform um, so that you can kind of connect VR experiences because we believe that uh, the old App Store model of, uh, for example, listening to a song and then having to know the next name of the next song is not very immersive. So we believe you should be able to touch parts of stories and then the story evolves around whatever you do in it. And for that, we've created a platform and an SDK with all the existing game engines. Hi, I'm Christina Heller. I'm the CEO and co-founder of VR Playhouse. VR Playhouse is a creative studio and production company that specializes in all the things that fall under that VR umbrella. So 360 video, CG, and game engine interactive uh, VR. Um, we've worked on a lot of different projects over the last uh, three years. I would say almost any, if it fall, if every vertical that you can possibly think of that a VR project falls into, I think we've probably done at least one project in that, in that area. And, so for me, you know, given that our company uh, lives and dies over whether people embrace this medium, adoption is definitely something that I'm incredibly passionate about. And as a result, it's interesting. Like, I felt like the first two years, there was a lot of emphasis on storytelling and, and, and how we can, you know, begin to create compelling experiences in this, in this medium. And while I think that's really important, I'm now really passionate about trying to find practical use cases for this incredible tool, uh, things like real estate, healthcare, um, education, and trying to merge that with compelling storytelling. So um, that's my focus over the next couple of years because I think that um, looking at the practical applications for this tool and introducing people to, to it through those practical applications will lead to then greater adoption in the home and we'll be able to then do the, you know, the fun entertainment stuff that I think we all are excited to do. Uh, hi, my name is Vit uh, Goncharuk. I'm CEO and the founder of Augmented Pixels. Uh, a lot of people talking now about uh, technology called SLAM. Uh, we started to create this technology three years ago and I think now we have the most mature uh, simultaneous localization mapping technology. So probably if you're creating augmented reality glasses or you're creating autonomous robots or autonomous drones, you are working with us or you know about my company. Um, this is the core technology. Without SLAM, you cannot do augmented reality. Um, uh, yeah. Great. Um, and I'm Milad Sadat. I'm, I'm director of uh, public relations at HTC Vive. And I don't think my role needs much more explanation than that. If you want to write a great article about us after this, come, come see me. Um, I, uh, uh, I would encourage you guys to go to each of these folks' um, uh, websites if you haven't. There's some great stuff, uh, uh, including some great demos. And, and Christina, especially with VR Playhouse, they've done some, some, some awesome uh, narrative content that, 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 that is exciting. Um, uh, and in fact, that's what I want to start with, is content. And so I know there's plenty of room for, for continued adoption of the hardware, but there, you know, at some point you stop selling the hardware because it's sexy and you start selling it because people want to experience things that are on it. So um, from a content perspective, what do you guys feel for whether AR or VR are going to be some very important categories that are going to drive um, adoption going forward? Yeah, so I think, um, like you said, 
people are just gonna buy virtual reality because of the indefinite amount of content, just like people are buying TV sets, not because of the technology, but because of the content. And I think a lot of things that really will drive content is probably indirect um, education, things like National Geography, uh, where you can be very immersive into VR. So that's a lot of things that we're focused on right now, is how do we you know, uh, talk about or build stories around uh, real life nonfiction stuff, and how do we transfer that into people? How do we use these quote unquote ultimate empathy machines to really um, you know, showcase these beautiful experiences that we have on this planet and, and, and showcase it to everyone who kind of um, you know, don't get the opportunity to travel as much or, or see it as much. Um, so one of the things that we're doing right now is we're working with uh, science writers, you know, James Nestor, and we've been you know, invited to different kinds of expeditions. Um, the most recent one is we're going to the hydrothermal vents off the coast of Brazil. So this is something that you know, not normally we get to see a lot, um, and you know, taking these 360 cameras and taking this technology down underwater about 2,000 feet, uh, you can really start to admire and appreciate all the uh, things that Mother Nature has to offer us. So that's one thing that I really like to focus on. Um, yeah, and uh, for example, we just did a case with KPMG um, for their business assessments because they had huge cancellation rates on these web forms. So we turned them into adventures. So you can enjoy uh, going to Neptune and uh, while you answer um, imagery <laughs> questions, more or less, um, uh, you get a lot more data points and you don't get that much cancellation rates upon your questions. Um, so we turned 70 data points into 600 um, and people are happy after answering questions to a consultancy, which helps. <laughs> I think there's going to be a huge opportunity in the next couple of years in the VR arcade space, you know, the site-specific VR space, um, because again, it makes a lot of sense for this. You know, uh, people will pay some money to go into a fun, crazy, immersive experience like the Ghostbusters experience that Jason was talking about earlier. Um, they can do it with their families, so that's very cool. And so, um, I think that that is a content play, is a safe bet for the next couple of years. I, I also am excited about things like healthcare. You know, uh, the, on the last panel, he was talking about um, pieces for stroke victims. We had the opportunity to work with USC on a piece that they were developing for motor skills and stroke victims. And, and so for us, it was like, okay, the way that they had a, you know, an EEG reader that was connected to a VR headset. And the way it worked was when the, the stroke victim, who had lost motor function, thought about moving their right arm, their right arm in the VR piece would move. Um, so again, potentially, it's not totally proven yet, reinforcing the neural pathways that could lead to regain motor function. But when we met with the USC team, you know, they had been working mm -hmm. on a grant, it was just like this little green arm in like a white space. <laughs> and we were like, well, look, I think we can make it a little cooler than that. So uh, we took it over to VRP and we made it a beautiful nature environment and now when your arm goes out, a hummingbird lands on it and creating like a positive reinforcement for fulfilling the, the, the objective. And I think that that's for me really interesting right now. It's like there's, there's interesting techno, like this is an inter interesting piece of technology, but I think when we merge it with great content, that's when we're gonna be able to see like the true promise of what this thing can do and, and how powerful it is um, come out. I, you know, as far as like home-based, you know, entertainment use of VR, I'm, I'm still a little skeptical right now because of the way that the headsets are very clunky and big. Mm -hmm. um, I feel that where it is right now, if I wasn't actively working in VR, I wouldn't probably go home and play with it at the end of the night, you know, because of just like how big and, uh, you know, isolating it kind of feels. I think we're obviously when it becomes as easy as putting on Oakley's as we've been talking about, we'll see um, more movement into that space. But anyway, I think that pro focusing on the practical, ap practical applications right now is probably a good move. Um, my company is more about core technology, so I'm I know less, much less about uh, about content. But I'm pretty sure what content is the king. Uh, and uh, but before uh, people will consume content, you need the right technology stack, including hardware and and software. Uh, but what personally surprised me recently is what I found: what uh, several virtual reality games are profitable. So people even now earning like earning money. Uh, in game industry, so they can like I know someone game would uh, earn it about three million dollars. Job simulator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so even now you can earn money in this early stage industry like virtual reality and augmented reality. And uh, I can remember what in 2011 my company created 
game called uh, augment, uh, uh, AR basketball. So you can play in, in basketball in augmented reality. And it was, again, it was 2011. And this game was featured in uh, Apple as a new Newsworthy Games. And we got like one million of downloads. It was six years ago. So I think, and but we still early stage. So I mean like industry early stage. Uh, but now some companies can earn money, which is good, very good. Great. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to break the fourth wall here because I have a timer that's stuck at 30 minutes. So I just want to give you guys a heads up if you want to give me a time. Um, uh, 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 I want to actually um, go deeper into something um, that Christina mentioned, which is location-based, out-of-home mm -hmm. VR. Um, we certainly think it's important at uh, HTC. We're actually um, right now uh, trial testing uh, an arcade platform, an arcade content delivery platform uh, uh, globally, something we think we're, we're going to be able to launch later this year. Um, uh, the challenges that we see, and right now it's more from a perception perspective than actual business, is this notion of arcades went away, they went away for a reason, especially in the West here, they seem, you know, it's a very, very niche market. How will it grow to become as big again as it used to be? So what are some of the things that do uh, you guys think, well, we need to overcome to kind of reestablish arcades this time via, via virtual reality and maybe AR? Um, I think that's actually a really good point. Um, you know, coming from Vive as well, so, so we're one of Vive's portfolio companies, and, and we were out in Asia and in China and Shenzhen looking at all the different kinds of arcades there um, that they're setting up over there. So there's about 5,000 VR arcades and cafes across that country. But what we see here is retention is a big problem. You know, people are pro trying these games that are, you know, a three minute demo and they're never coming back again. So that's one of the biggest challenges that I think we have to face. And here out west, you know, we're setting up our micro theaters across the country as well. And what we see here is it's a very different audience. You know, different cities, different states have very different um, understandings and different um, knowledge bases and also different interests. So. I think we have to really tackle niche environments and start there. So, so our strategy is we partner with museums and aquariums and zoos where the people who actually go to these places are already interested in learning about the science, learning about the animals, learning about you know, all the wonders um, of the world. So that's why you know, our content serves these people directly. There's about 450,000 monthly visitors interested in learning, so why don't we give them something to learn about? Why don't we give them some content they want to see? And that's gonna drive a more positive kind of connection with these bulky headsets, like, like one of them mentioned before. Um, this is what's gonna really get you to want to buy these headsets and really want to buy your children these headsets and, and, and you know, uh, proliferate and even you know, drive content growth. I think that's uh, probably the things that we have to tackle first. And the individualization of content in itself, so that people can actually experience their own story, what the medium allows you to do. And I think we are in the very, very early stages of really having everybody experience their own perspective of a story, their own um, position in a story, um, so that we can, so everybody can talk and say, okay, I saw that and I saw that, and oh, I didn't see that. So I think that is what the medium allows, but yeah, we are at very, very early stages of that. Well, we all, if you've tried the HTC Vive, we all know that going inside the VR headset feels like magic. But I feel like what's missing in a lot of the location-specific VR activations I've seen is the magic of the physical activation around the VR piece. So I was in Vegas and I went to see a, 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 a VR exhibit that they were charging people to, to play with. And they had heavy metal music playing and it was like green and black. And I was just like, oh my gosh, there's so many things wrong with this. Like, not that you need like unicorns jumping over rainbows, but it wouldn't be a bad place to start. Like if we started making the physical environments around the arcades look like these like exciting, immersive theater experiences, which actually the Ghostbusters exhibit in New York did a great job with. Like everything leading up to that experience like got you kind of in this magical new headspace. So by the time you put on that headset, um, it was next level. I think that one of the big challenges, I'm sure you guys recognize this, is just like cleanliness, like putting people, like cranking people through the headsets. Like that was definitely something I noticed was a challenge. Um, you know, and, and then some people, uh, you know, get, are a little more sensitive to motion and things like that. So uh, these are all things I think as an industry we have to overcome and, and, and mm -hmm. it'll get easier, but standards for like cranking people through arcades are gonna have to be um, developed, I think. Um, 
according to my practice, uh, I think what like people don't like to walk because they don't want to do anything. They just want to sit and watch. And, uh, and consume, yeah? So uh, if you're creating some kind of different experience, uh, people should have some, they need to receive some value from this. Mm. So if uh, you receive some really something what works for you, you're doing this. If you have some motivation to walk somewhere, you're doing this. If you have so no motivation, uh, you will prefer just to sit and watch some TV. So I think we need to concentrate on some value what we bring uh, it's not only about uh, augmented reality or virtual reality. It's about like really value for for a human. Why is he doing this? Great. Um, and uh, again, you know, Christina, I don't mean to keep coming, <laughs> but uh, she has a great point because the whole hygiene issue. Uh, you know, a, a greasy joystick on an arcade machine is one thing. When it's on your face, it's a whole different story. So, um, uh, uh, and I don't know if you guys have seen the face napkins that are now becoming pretty popular at trade shows to put on face headsets. napkins. Those are great. Yeah. I don't know if that's the right term. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, I want to talk about um, AR a little bit now. Uh, I know that, that, that uh, a few of you, potentially all of you, actually have some, have some work that you do in AR. So um, I did do a little bit of research for this. So I, I actually came across a, a figure from ABI Research, um, uh, where by their estimate, uh, VR right now outpaces AR in revenue by about 50%. Um, uh, but then at the same time, they forecast that within two years, by 2019, AR will uh, leapfrog VR in revenue, which is pretty, pretty, pretty tremendous growth. And so, um, uh, you know, first, if you guys agree with that rapid pace of growth for AR, so if you don't, please, please, please do say, say so. Um, if you do agree with it, what do you think is going to drive that sudden surge for AR? So I think there's always this notion of VR versus AR. But, um, you know, I really believe that they're two sides of the same coin. You know, they're both standing at the forefront of this entire uh, new innovative uh, visual computing powers that we have today. And um, frankly speaking, they're, they're both big. They're both um, massive kind of industry changing technology. They're both going to cover a span of industries. And, and frankly, comparing the two would be like comparing, say, entertainment versus agriculture. I don't think they're comparable. They're both going to be very life changing um, in, in all industries and in all, across all departments, across all kind of applications. But I don't think we should directly pit them against each other. And maybe you guys can disagree with that. Maybe you guys think that AR will completely overshadow VR. But, you know, coming from VR specifically, I really think that um, it is the ultimate entertainment device. I mean, you're you're, you're trying to escape life. That's why you're using. Um, that's why you're using VR. You're trying to run away. Um, it's like a. It's like kind of like an alternative to drugs. I think you know. Like you know, you really put this thing on. You're in this new world, and uh, AR is kind of like subtitles for your world, right? You know, you you get to clarify some of the points, some of the more um, questionable things, maybe in, in your work life and in, in your job. Um, I, I think you know you can't really compare the two this way. Um, I don't know. What do you guys think? Uh, maybe they can actually enable each other. So yeah. maybe there's a part of the story which happens in the room, there's a dragon flying around here, and then you use a digital asset and throw it against it, and then you're in <laughs> VR. You know? Yeah. So, well, it's yeah, interesting, yeah, exactly what you were saying. I was just going like, to make the counter-argument, which is that the reason I actually do think AR has a really bright future is because it does involve my actual life. You know, I'm not trying often to escape my life, although that is, I do love the drugs without drugs <laughs> aspect about VR. But I think that what's really exciting is the idea of making my actual life easier, um, more engaging, mm. more compelling, um, maybe more cost-effective, um, more magical. And so I think that um, I, it's, I think that's why AR is the one that people are kind of betting on. But I also think that you're right. Like I like I, my again, we're like jumping way into the future here, but I love to imagine these Oakleys that can go back and forth. You know, right. where I'm like, now I'm gone, now I'm back. Uh -huh. um, but one thing I've, I, a point that I'd like to make about the AR thing is that. Um, we need, and I'm very bullish about web VR for, because I do think it can event, help drive adoption and it provides a little bit of a bridge right now between desktop, mobile, and eventually he like headset use. Um, but what's also very cool about starting to turn our websites into three-dimensional um, interactive environments is we can start to think about how content is framed within the lens of our view. I mean, we talk about AR, but we don't have, I think, a lot of discussions yet about like, how that is going, where in our view is that going to pop up? Like, how is content mm -hmm. going to interact with the rest of the things in our world? And we're going to have to start experimenting with that so it doesn't just, like, become an assault on the senses when we do eventually get right. the glasses the going. The integration part of it. Yeah, yeah, that's the word. 
I have, very, uh, I have I don't now, want to force everybody to speak on every topic, but but all the different. <laughs> I have a very interesting point of view, like like black screen, black wall behind me, like just two two lights, and I cannot see anyone. Like for me, it's like I'm here. Uh, so uh, I have some. I, I want to see on this. Uh, uh, on the, I want to answer from on this question from other point of view. So I think like uh, I'll be corporates now trying to create new iPhone. Uh, like mixed reality iPhone. So they totally understand what this is, they will be our future. And they don't want to miss opportunity of, of new iPhone. And uh, in short term perspective, to create uh, something very quickly, it was possible uh, on, uh, in, in virtual reality. Like Google Cardboard is very easy to create. Uh, to create uh, augmented reality glasses, you need to have much more wider technology stack. You need to have a slam, you need to have good hardware, good optic, blah, blah, blah. So all this take more time. Um, and I think what uh, in short term, like in two, three years, VR will be still maybe, uh, will have more, uh, more market, but after that augmented reality will have a much larger market, more money, etc. But I'm pretty sure what in 20 years, VR will be much bigger than AR because to create like fully immersive experience in virtual reality when you feeling wind, when you feeling smell or uh, like of flavor, sorry, etc. It's it's more exciting experience, but we are very far away from real virtual reality. So I think augmented reality is some kind of compromise before we will have full experience in virtual reality. Uh, this is my maybe strange point. Great. Yeah. Um, I do agree with you, Vitaly. It feels like we're presenting to two oncoming trains here, but, <laughs> yeah. um, I, uh, which will keep us on, on our toes, I guess. Um, uh, I want to talk about, earlier I mentioned how, how there's this notion that content's going to drive adoption for VR. And we can intermix, guys, because there's a notion that VR, and you guys touched on it, and AR will eventually bl you know, blend into this thing called potentially a mixed reality device. Um, but for the hardware. Uh, what's it going to take? Uh, improvements, changes, uh, near term. What's it going to take to get more people um, to, 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 to bring that into their homes, adopt it on a consumer level? Mm -hmm. Well, we can always get you know better OLED panels, brighter OLED, um, better pixel density. We can always have folding optic traces, you know, making picture qualities better, blown up on a bigger screen. Um, but frankly speaking, I think you know a lot of people say maybe headsets have to get smaller. Um, maybe um, you know the, the design have to be more appealing. You don't, you can't look you know, ridiculous wearing it on the train. I've been wearing my VR headset, I've been wearing Daydream or, or gear on the train every time I commute from San Francisco to here. And I always, you know, have headphones off so I can hear what people are talking about me. And there's some pretty nasty things out there, you know. Um, you know, until that becomes something more conformable, like, I, I think we, we have an issue here. Um, but, but, you know, frankly speaking, like, companies like HTC Vive have provided with, you know, us with this, uh, box of wonders that, you know, it's a black box, you put it on and you don't know what's gonna happen, it's brilliant. And it's, it's good enough for us creatives to really take on and, and, and do lots of um, creative things with. And, and I think it's at a point where hardware can take a rest and software, you know, we do need better compression algorithm, but software as yeah. in content needs to catch up. Um, and I think before that happens, um, maybe we shouldn't, you know, VCs here, we, we shouldn't be funding all these tool sets that no one are using, but instead empowering these creatives to start using these tools that have been built already. So that's kind of like my two cents here. Um, and in the end, for the, for the consumers to really adopt the hardware in a way, um, the stories have to really add more value in terms of purpose mm -hmm. for them to put the headsets on. So uh, I believe from, from a resolution perspective, et cetera, the, the headsets are good, they could be better, but um, everybody knows that this will happen. So um, I believe the purpose, I think the major challenge is software right now. Yeah, obviously if, if, it, if the headsets were lighter and didn't kind of leave an <laughs> imprint on your face when you took it off, that'd be great. But I, I, I agree that um, the, they're actually not too bad and they're definitely getting better. And um, social, the social VR aspects will definitely make it more compelling. You know, the longest I've ever stayed in the headset was when I was able to be socializing with people inside the headset. So I think that's the thing. And, and really, I just think that 
it's such a change in the way that we're used to consuming media. If you look back at like the radio, it was still people kind of sitting around a radio. And then we go to the TV and we go to the computer. I mean, it's still a frame. And then, and so to ask somebody to put this on their face and start consuming media in this way, it's like, it's gonna take some time and it's gonna take some getting used to. And that's why I'm like, hey, well, if you put it on in the doctor, if you put it on in the doctor's office for the first time, first of all, that's like a place you might be willing to actually try it where you wouldn't normally try it because you're already at the hospital or in the doctor's office, you're like, oh, what the heck? And then, or, or same like at work at the workplace. Let's say you work in a real, you're a real estate developer, and again, you want to see your building built before it's built. Um, you might be more inclined to put that on for the first time because it has a very practical application. Then, once you've put it on your head a few times, and then after work, you're like, maybe I'll try, you know, um, super hot or one of these fun games. Then that is where I think that Christmas you might buy it for your home. So I think starting to integrate it, like I said, in these ways will drive then people to make that investment. And then lucky for us, kids really do like this. They and love it. The kids love Absolutely. it. And so and it was just just a whole other thing to process. <laughs> but um, I think that kids will start enjoying this more and more and parents will buy it for them and then that will see some growth in that area as well. Uh, since I tried uh, Microsoft HoloLens like one year ago, I understand what this is it. So like we need just uh, 10 times better device. Just time, 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 times 10 better device. And it will be mass market. Uh, so it, we will use it instead of iPhones uh, or Android devices. Uh, I, I'm also seeing what even now you can, uh, the quality, like hardware quality of some devices enough for industrial use cases. So you can use it uh, uh, for education, you can use it uh, for logistics, etc. So even now, it's enough for industrial. For mass market, we still need maybe five years to improve sensors, to improve uh, battery lifetime, and to improve algorithms and uh, like all these technologies, like user interface, etc. That's why VR is <laughs> because of qualities right now mm -hmm. a lot better from a from an experience perspective. So if you're in Hololens, you you know. It's a good device. 45 but, degrees tracking but, only. But you only see this window, <laughs> essentially. You know, it looks different than the marketing materials. But um, um, And there is a company in the valley, I think, called Meta. I think they're here right now. Yeah? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think they're yeah. somewhere here. Um, uh, the, their field of view is a lot better, but they're still working on the, on the tracking. So it's really... Um, there, there are still some technological challenges for people to really have an added value experience. Mm -hmm. um, that's why VR is probably the uh, finding its way into enterprise right now very much because there's quality. You can show it to customers. Mm -hmm. You can bring, you can show them all your products. We've done quite a lot of business on exhibitions um, where people can take their whole product portfolio with them. Um, so there is definitely added value, and I think companies have to learn what is possible. Um, and then obviously the tools have to adjust in accordance uh, what the customers really want, because one thing is creating tech, but on the other hand, customers will say, I, I don't press that button because actually, I don't I like it. I want to jump in too while we're on this. I actually think there's another really great opportunity in the space in virtual retail. And what's been cool is like, you know, customers I think are, like I'm noticing clients are starting to talk with us more and more about that. But um, virtual retail is a very exciting, I think, future application for this stuff. Um, imagine if, you're uh, like a housewife in Wisconsin could go to a t like a beautiful flagship Tiffany store in from her home and maybe even socialize with other women or men who are at that inside the same like spectacular um, representation of what like an actual Tiffany's experience would be like. It's so much more compelling than going you know, to a 2D website. There's one thing missing: no. the Starbucks. <laughs> <laughs> Virtual anyway, drinks. Just wanted to throw food. that out there while I had a mic in front of my face. Yeah. No, actually, that's a good point. Uh, actually, in Singles Day, I think Vive launched something with Alibaba, right, in China doing this. Um, and, and Amazon's doing something like that similar today. Um, okay. Okay. <laughs> no question. Are, are we out of time, or do we have time for one more? I think we are. We're out of time. Okay. <laughs> I, will, I still want to add one point to, to, to yeah. the enterprise side of things. You guys touched on some, some, some great um, areas where it's going to have impact. Another that we're seeing is workforce training. Mm. Mm. And there's some really, really cool things happening. Um, and right now it's starting with difficult to train for jobs or expensive to train for jobs. And stuff you wouldn't expect, I'm going to give you my top example, is 
Um, uh, underwater drilling for oil rigs. They're actually starting to use VR because to put somebody in that environment takes a lot of money and a lot of risk. To be able to show them some of the basics in VR is obviously a, a benefit. So that's becoming pretty big too. But we're out of time that's that's awesome. because of the discussion, the great discussion that you guys led. So thank you <laughs> all um, for, for, for some great thoughts and thank you guys for putting up with us. Thank you. Awesome, thank you. Thank you.